don't do anything else you are you we have done it right <laughs> bear with me okie dokie so okay so we're on lovely right so we're just going to go through some slides to tell you guys when you're importing food into the uk um what the legal requirements are for labeling the food items um, as they come into the UK. Okay, so in this session, we're gonna cover the mandatory requirements for pre-packed foods intended for sale in the UK. So just to let you know, in um, EU regulation, what a pre-packed food is. So this is a food that is packaged into a wrapper or a cellophane or a, a paper packet, but it's, it's in that wrapper completely or partially, but you're not able to alter the state of that food without opening or changing the packaging. So the, effectively the food is tamper proof. You can't open that packet, you can't get into it. That is called a pre-packed food, okay? And that is the most popular food um, that is sold in the, you know, in the UK, in the sh shops, in the supermarkets. Um, so we will be covering requirements for that because I'm assuming that is the majority of the food types being imported uh, to the UK. Okay, so when you're labelling food intended for sale in the UK, there's some basics that you need to have. It needs to be clear, legible and indelible. So you need to be able to read it. Um, the font needs to be clear, um, not, not too fancy. The minimum font size, so the minimum text size that the letters must be is 1.2 millimeters. So this is for lowercase letters. Um, so, and they normally use an E as an example um, text. So no smaller than 1.2 mil. There are exemptions, um, which we won't go into that today um, for products with slightly smaller surface areas, but 1.2 millimeters is the minimum. It must be okay. and in one field of vision. So if your packet is square or rectangular or a triangle on one field of vision or one surface, you need to have the name of the food and the quantity. So the consumer can look at that product and see at a glance what it is and how much of it they're getting. Obviously, if it was an alcoholic um, product, um, you also need to have um, the alcohol percentage declaration on that field of vision as well. Okay, right. So requirement number one is to have the name of the food on your product. Obviously, we would like to know what we're buying. So whether it's a chocolate biscuit, um, jackfruit biryani, um, uh, orange squash, we need to have a name of the food. Okay, so basically the name of the food needs to tell a consumer what they're going to be eating. That is a mandatory requirement. However, if one of the, the name of the food is a little bit quirky, it's, um, it's called hot and spicy sauce or um, tantalizingly fantastic biscuit. When you look at that name of the food, it doesn't tell a consumer what it is. What what are they eating? So you will need to accompany the name of the food with um, a description. So whilst the name of the food is the legal mandatory requirement, if that name of the food isn't clear, you do need to supply it with a description. Um, so hot and spicy sauce might be a blend of um, spices with diced vegetables in a tomato sauce. Okay, right. Requirement number two needs to be an ingredient list. So we know what the food is and we have a description if we need it, but we need to know what's in that ingredient list. So when you write your list of ingredients for foods into the UK, they need to be in order of descending weight. So the largest ingredient down to the smallest ingredient, okay? That ingredient list also needs to have um, quantitative information in relation to any ingredients or foods mentioned 
in the name of the food or the food description. If I had jackfruit biryani, I keep coming back to Nisha's product. We mentioned the name jackfruit, okay? So in the list of ingredients, jackfruit needs to have a percentage um, declared next to it, okay? In Nisha's description of a jackfruit biryani, she would have said jackfruit maybe infused in spices with um, rice, okay? So because we've mentioned jackfruit and the rice, we also need to declare the percentage of that ingredient list that the rice makes up as well, okay? Still sticking with the list of ingredients, but this is a separate mandatory requirement. You must provide information relating to allergenic ingredients. So in the same list of ingredients, we're covering three things. We've got the list of ingredients in the first instance. Then we've got the quantity of ingredients in relation to naming it in the food or the description. And then we also have to highlight what of those ingredients are allergens, okay? And there is no legal requirement as to how they're highlighted, but the most common um, way to highlight uh, allergens we tend to see is this in bold, so the text is made into bold, or it's in capitals, okay? It can be both, bold and capitals. And just a little reminder for you then, in the UK, we have 14 allergens, okay? So I'm not going to read through them all, um, but there are 14 allergens in the UK that must be highlighted, okay? And it's important to put underneath your list of ingredients, should you have allergens, a statement to direct consumers to look at the ingredients um, for information on allergens. And there's an example here. For allergens, see ingredients in bold, or you could say for allergens, see ingredients in capitals, okay? When it comes to gluten and nuts, obviously there's lots of different types or sources of gluten. You've got barley, oat, wheat, rye. You need to be specific with the source of the gluten. So you can't say, um, just trying to think of an example. Um, you can't just say gluten. You must must put um, cereals, bracket, rye, oats, barley, okay? Um, same with nuts as well. We've got peanuts as an allergen, but we also have um, tree nuts, okay? So you need to put, whether it's a cashew or a pecan or a walnut, okay? So you need to be specific with your um, gluten and nut allergens. In the UK, it is frowned upon to put what we call alibi labeling when it comes to allergens. So you may see, you may only have one or two allergens in your, ingredient, in your product, but underneath you put a statement to say, also handled in the factory that has milk, egg, celery, sulfites, mustard, fish. That's frowned upon because it confuses the consumer and is seen to be well, just, it's just not good practice, okay? So in the UK, you need to be specific with your allergens. Don't go down the route of this alibi labeling, which is frowned upon, and put more focus on your supplier approval and looking back at your suppliers and looking at, looking at their risk assessments with regards to allergen handling and management, okay? Um, just because they may not be um, as strict as they should be, it shouldn't put the onus on you then to have to put this alibi labeling on, okay? So requirement four, we touched on earlier. So this was the quantitative ingredient declaration. So we went over this earlier as part of the ingredient listing where we had the list of ingredients and put in a percentage of a specific ingredient if it's named in the food or in the description, okay? And just to add to that, it's important when you name a food that it represents the list of ingredients. And what I mean by this is an example in the UK is a chicken and mushroom pie. Okay. okay? So the product's called a chicken and mushroom pie. When you look at your ingredients, you expect to see more chicken than mushroom because of chicken and mushroom pie. However, when you look at the back of pie, 
ak, it says that there's actually more mushroom than chicken. So your pie should be called a mushroom and chicken pie. So you can't mislead the consumer by shouting about an ingredient um, as the first named ingredient of the food, but actually it's very small amount of it in there. Okay, so trading standards in the UK um, kind of do a lot of enforcement based on what we call it misleading. It's a bit subjective, but it could be misleading. So try and make sure that what you describe it as is reflected in the list of ingredients. Requirement number five, you must have nutritional declaration on your um, packaging. So in the UK, um, you have got um, to list the nutritional requirements per 100 grams. It's not a legal requirement to put per serving, per pack, per piece of cake or whatever. You just need to have um, the list um, per 100 grams or per 100 millilitres if it's a liquid. Okay, so just to show you here. You need to have energy, um, which is declared as kilojoules and kilocalories. <clears throat> Excuse me. You need to declare fat, of which saturates, carbohydrates, of which sugars, protein and salt. Okay. You, you might note here that fibre is not a mandatory requirement, but it is a voluntary one. I see that a lot um, in amongst the mandatory listings. Um, it's, it's not a mandatory requirement to list fibre but you, it doesn't, doesn't do any harm if you do, okay? Um, but those are the um, seven areas there with regards to the nutritional, okay? You can declare your nutritional based on laboratory testing or theoretical analysis, okay? It can be very expensive to do um, laboratory analysis and it is advised you've got five to 10 products, um, but um, you can base your um, nutritional on theoretical okay du requirement number six is durability date marking of course when we eat um, the food we need to know it's at its best quality so there might be a best before or there may be a use by date which is an indication of when the food is safe to use by okay so best before is quality based it could be biscuits it could be cake it could be pasta it could be tinned products jarred products things that have a long shelf life and tend to be low risk and can be stored ambient for a long period of time. Or you can have a use by date, which is for fresh high risk foods that typically need a refrigeration. Sometimes um, when people mark with a durability date, they also um, make a note of in a lot numbers or traceability coding. That's not a legal requirement in the UK to do that, but you must be able to um, be able to undertake full traceability um, simply with the date mark that you've provided if that is how you do your traceability. Requirement seven, you need to provide a declaration of weight or net quantity on your product, okay? Um, so in grams or milliliters, okay? Um, one thing to note here, and I see a lot of this, is the difference between minimum weight and average weight. In the UK and throughout Europe, you might see a weight, so say for example, 70 grams with an E, a small E after that. And that is an indication that that food has been packed to what we refer to as the th three packers rule. And when that food has been produced, the manufacturer is able to guarantee three things, okay? Um, I won't go into that detail today, but what happens is a lot of people put that E on their packaging okay and then when it comes to enforcement you're not able to demonstrate compliance in those three areas so i always recommend to my customers to pack to a minimum weight okay so if you're packing to and you're declaring 70 grams this is excluding packaging so it's the weight of the food not with the packaging um, if you're selling 70 grams always pack slightly over maybe five percent over because in the uk if trading standards enforcement should take a product and weigh it and it is under the 70 grams or the weight you've declared, that is an offence, okay? And you could be fined up to £5,000 per product. So if you've got a box of 10, a lot of money, okay? So my advice is pack to the minimum weight unless your manufacturer has got robust systems in place to support the three-packers rule, okay? Requirement eight, 
we need to know who makes the product. So you need to put the name and address of the manufacturer. Okay. So it needs to be, um, sometimes perhaps it could be produced for, um, produced on behalf of Jack and Chill Foods um, by Joe Bloggs, PO Box, such and such and such. You need to have the name and address of the manufacturer. So it doesn't need to be the full address, but it needs to be an address that a, a posted letter will arrive to. So some people don't like to put um, their full address if they're based from home, for example, um, but simply putting the name of the business and a postcode um, is sufficient um, to do that. Um, but it is important to put the durability, um, sorry, the name and address of the manufacturer on the product. So those were the moments when it comes to packing food into the UK and what goes on the label. There are some additional ones um, that um, I'll just pop over now. So storage instructions. If your food is high risk, um, you are required to um, provide some information on how that food should be stored safely before it's used, okay? So it doesn't need to be cooked, doesn't need to be reheated, doesn't need defrosting before cooking, okay? Are there any special and storage instructions? So keep refrigerated, keep frozen. If it's a cake or a biscuit or a, a long life product, should you store it in a cool dark place or out of direct sunlight? Origin marking, okay? So I won't cover this in full today, but if your label is a bit misleading without origin being declared, then you need to consider putting more information about the origin of your food. Um, and finally, alcoholic strength. If you're bringing alcohol into the UK and it's got more than 1.2% alcohol, then you need to declare that information um, on that label as well, okay? So, something that Nisha and I would like to um, offer you today um, for anybody attending the course and as part of the um, India Import Food uh, Group on Facebook um, is that, as uh, Nisha mentioned, with my experience, I do offer full label legal compliance reports for foods coming into the UK. So if you quote hashtag India as part of your um, getting in touch with either Nisha or myself. And if you can see at the bottom of the screen, we've got um, contact details for Beacon Compliance. Then I'm offering for one label review into the UK, um, £100 for a full detailed report and any additional label at £75. Okay, so make sure you write down hashtag India and get in touch with Nisha or myself after um, today if you want me to have a look at any of your labels. So, any questions? So I will just come out of the screen share. Yes, and I'm back. I hope that yes. was really swift. I think I did it in 20 minutes. Yes, <laughs> so yes. Very, very quick, I know. But thank you very yes. much, Katie. That was, that was really quick and informative as well. I, I, I'm sure uh, others would have found it useful as well. We, there is nothing on the chat yet, but if anybody has a question to begin with, please free, feel free to unmute yourself and then uh, you know, you can start asking the questions. Or else I've got a couple of questions if nobody has, but I can, I'll give a chance to others to have a quick, uh, you know, questionnaire. Okay. Um, hi, Katie. Hi. This is Joe. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you so much for the lovely session. Uh, I have one question around here uh, regarding name and address for the manufacturer on the uh, food product. So when you say the name and address for the manufacturer uh, and uh, like a person like me, if I'm adding the branding, just adding the branding and my manufacturer is in India. So do I need to mention my address or there or the exact manufacturer? Because I don't want people to contact directly to my manufacturer. They want, uh, they should be contacting me directly for any issues. So which address should I mention? So you should be putting the um, address of the registered business owner or operator. So, um, so, so for example, with um, Jack and Chill Foods, I keep referring to Nisha, um, obviously she might have that subcontracted to someone else to be manufacturing, but Jack and Chill Foods is the legal owner of that brand. So yes, you would put the um, contact inf information for that brand or that business on the packaging. Does that help? 
Yeah. yeah. So um, suppose if I'm operating from home, and uh, um, so I'll have to take the virtual office address for that then. Um, so if you're, are you? Um, so you've got a manufacturer in India making food for you that you're bringing into the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you would have to put the um, address that any correspondence would arrive to you at. So mm -hmm. if you've got a virtual address, PO Box address, um, but yes. you get the correspondence, then that is fine. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorted. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Just to add to that, uh, Joe, what I do is I say manufactured in India so that you can mm -hmm. show the origin as well. So manufactured in India for, uh, you know, Jack and Chill and then my address here so that you're covered. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. We've got Thank two you. questions Thank come here. So one of them is asking, is it relevant the food produced in the UK in a house or is it just for imported food? So, so yeah, so is this relevant to food produced in the UK in a house or just imported food? Yes. Yeah, so if you're producing food in the UK in a house, you should be registered as a, as a food business from your home with your local authority anyway. Okay, and then if you're producing food for sale um, to a retailer, so um, if you're going into a shop or uh, someone else is going to sell your food, you need to have full labeling on the product. There are some exemptions with selling locally within your authority where uh, nutritional information is exempt. Um, but to avoid complication, I always advise my clients just do the full labeling. If you're selling food, produced in your house and a customer comes to your house to pick it up a bit like a, a home takeaway or you're selling your food at a market store so maybe a farmer's market there are different requirements for that as well it's a lot less information um, but like I said with my clients who do both retail and farmer markets um, just label everything correctly so that you've covered all um, aspects okay yeah, she said she's um, selling it directly to the customers, not to the shop. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so she won't need to do the full um, labeling. That will be more about conversations about allergens and any intolerances when the customer places the order. But um, she just get in touch directly. Um, I offer 15 minutes free food safety advice. So um, just give me an email or a call and uh, we can arrange an appointment. Um, is there a tool you recommend for calculating nutritional declaration without having it lab tested? Yeah, I use, um, yeah, some people are saying there you've got Alicalc, you've got Nutrimen. Um, I use some software called Label Logic Live, which also is good for designing your labels. Um, so that's um, Label Logic Live is what I use. Um, you, there is a long-winded way you can do it on Excel and put calculations and formulas in, but there is a number out there, like you said, Alicalc, Nutriman. They often give you, say, the first five for free. Um, but um, something that I offer as well is um, back a pack list of ingredient declarations and nutritional information um, based on your recipes. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of good advice there. Maybe on we those. could send this after in an email, maybe all these uh, websites, we could do that. Yeah, 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 that's not a problem. Um, okay, what have we got next? I've got a question if you don't mind. Hello. Hi. Thank you for your uh, presentation. First of all, it was very informative. Uh, okay. In regards, I've just got three small questions. Um, I just want to clarify. So I know you said the name and the address of the manufacturer is required. So I have a co-packer. So would I put my address or the co-packers? Because I know the question was asked. So I just want to confirm it. Yeah. So um, it, it's your brand though, yeah? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it would be your, it would be the business that is legally responsible for that product. So that is you. That would be your address. Cool. And you know how you said earlier in the, in, you put the address of the manufacturer as well. So that's no longer needed. It's just my address of my office. Yeah. So ultimately your address needs to go on there, be all and end all. If you want to make reference to your co-packer, you can, because, you know, that might be the arrangement, but the be all and end all is the address of the brand or the business that is legally responsible for that product. Um, you could put produced by, 
John's co-packer in Bolton on behalf of Sarah's Cakes Liverpool. You know, so it depends um, on your co-packer relationship if there's any demand on that. Um, but the minimum is for your business and your address as that's related to the brand. Lovely, thank you. And also I had a question about claims. So I know there's um, information about sort of like what we can say and what we can't say. Um, mm -hmm. And I have packaging that I have ready, but I'm just unsure about the claim. So am I right to send them across and use that service that you provide? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, claims can be a bit of a minefield. Yeah, yeah, they're definitely a bit of a minefield. So they're very confusing because I've put easy to digest, but then what's that based on? And so I'll pop yes. this here and, and um, use those services. So thank you for yeah. that. And the last thing is I have actually put an E on the end because it's 330 milliliter packaging, but I'm using Tetra Pak. So I've put right. the E on the end, but I was absolutely not aware that, that I was supposed to guarantee three things, which I know you didn't discuss, but mm -hmm. maybe... We can discuss it on email or something. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, your your did you, you said that you had a co-packer, yeah? Mm-hmm. Are they BRC? Yeah, they are. They are. So they, I'd like to think that their technical people are ensuring that they're packing correctly to the three package rules. But yeah, if you get in touch, I can tell you what they are, and then you can just go back to your supplier and just uh, um, clarify that they're able to demonstrate. Um, that they are compliant with that. Lovely, that's okay. perfect. My question, thank you so much. It's okay. Um, we've got a couple of people asking the same question, like because uh, most of them are importers. If you make the food in India, and obviously you can get the food tested in the lab in India, so will that be accepted in the UK lab or do you have to get it retested in the UK lab? So as long as the lab is, um, UCAS accredited, which is a United Kingdom accreditation, of course, or operates to ISO 17,000, or don't quote me on it, I'll put it in an email. But basically, I think Nisha, we covered this last year, yeah. um, your lab um, is, was operating to principles and practices that are recognized globally. So um, there are techniques they should be following. So I can let you know, Nisha, um, what that ISO standard is. Um, for your um, colleagues here to go back and double check that. But if that is the case, that is fine. They can yeah. accept that. I think, yeah, from my experience as well, as long as the Indian lab where you do the testing is UK accredited, then, uh, you know, it should be okay to have it in the UK. So, but if you, I'll send yeah. you the details when Katie sends it to me. Um, okay. And then somebody's asking, are these labelings valid in the EU as well for the food products? Yes, it is. Um, so obviously the legislation that we currently work to in the UK is European owned or, you know, it's generated by the EU as, so if you, um, create a label, there are some local, um, uh, or country specific things to bear in mind. So different countries may have different allergens. Um, so you do need to look at local legislation to make sure that you tick those boxes, but yeah, it is a EU, EU compliant standard. So um, these mandatory things we've covered today will be for uh, applicable in the UK. If anything, it's going to be a bit different for us based in the UK exporting shortly because of Brexit. Um, uh, there may be some changes um, in the future, but um, I'll keep you posted, Nisha, on anything for us to be aware of. But no, it'll be fine for the EU as well. And on, on average, how much does it cost to get a product lab tested and how long does it take? Okay, so there's lots of different labs um, speaking on the UK here. Uh, we have lots of different labs in the UK, but on average, you can have a fast turnaround of five days up to say 10 days. The faster the test, the, the more expensive it is. But as a bit minimum, you're looking at about 90 pounds um, per product tested. So if you've got 10 products, it can be a lot of money. Um, what I tend to advise is if you've got 10 products that are, that are a variation of a recipe, um, get the base recipe or the base product tested and then use that in your um, theoretical calculations as your base. And then you're making adjustments to that base with additions, um, and use the theoretical then. And then maybe 
over the next few years um, test the range just through due diligence. Um, but in the first instance, um, you wouldn't need to um, uh, test them all necessarily unless you're making claims nutrition wise. So high omega, high calcium and things like that. You know, if you're going down that route, then you would need testing to back your claims up. Thanks, Katie. That's really useful. That's OK. Yeah. And I think we've got time for um, one last question, which is uh, if it's a single raw product like raw basmati rice, do we still need to do lab testing? Um, no, I mean, if it's a, uh, a product that is as presented by the earth, so or as presented from an animal, um, then there is a, a database called McCants and Widdison that um, technical um, colleagues have access to and a lot of uh, like Nutriman and Alicalc are based on that data um, source. Um, you can use theoretical um, nutritional information to create your, um, your nutritional information. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so that's it. I think we've got hardly one and a half minutes left. Any more questions? Maybe one more? <laughs> Sorry, just wanted to confirm the email address that we're sending information to. Yeah, so um, my email is info, I-N-F-O, at beacon, B-E-A-C-O-N, dash compliance, dot co dot UK. All right. I'll just, um, maybe I'll just have a go at type it in here. Yeah. Uh, what I'll also do is I'll send you all the recording after this is done and uh, I'll send you Katie's details and also the online labs which we had uh, you know, where you can do your nutrition analysis and everything. So all the details I'll send it over to you after this call. So okay. yeah, Katie has just put in her details there. Yeah, so um yeah. Yep. So thanks very much for the, uh, you know, the wonderful session, Katie, today. It was uh, really, really helpful. So uh, all of you can get in touch with her after this uh, call or, you know, when you have any uh, doubts about your labeling or if you have any manufacturing doubts. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your time, Katie. It's okay. Um, I mean, the biggest thing I would say is if in doubt, get it checked out. It's much cheaper to pay for a label review than have a product recall a fine off your customers, um, you know, press in the UK because you've not declared an allergen when you should have, or the information is not correct. And not only that, the cost of artwork being designed, printing labels and packaging, it's not cheap. And there's nothing worse than me looking in the local supermarkets at, at labels or shops and finding that there's an error on the packaging. Um, you know, the amount of recalls I see in the UK because of packaging errors. Um, it's, it's quite a sight for sore eyes, really. Um, yes, exactly. but yeah, get in touch. And like I said, 15 minutes free advice and we have the label review offer as well. So yeah, it's nice to right. have yeah. helped you all as best as I can. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.